Good evening, everyone. My name is Chrissy, and I would like to welcome all of you to Passion, Patience, and Perseverance, a discussion comparing the polio health crisis to the COVID-19 pandemic with speakers Sean Heron, Mike McGovern, and Daniel Wilson. This evening, the speakers will be in conversation for about 35 to 40 minutes. I'll come back on screen to moderate the question and answer portion of the event after each speaker finishes his discussion. You may submit your questions by clicking on ask a question on your screen. Uh, if you're watching from a phone or tablet, please click the icon with a question mark to submit your questions there. Sean Heron grew up in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. Upon his graduation from Florida State University, he served in the US, US Army out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Afterward, he worked for the Department of Homeland Security in Washington, DC. Sean enjoys traveling and writing about his experiences, and he lives in Bucks County, PA, works at the Doylestown Bookshop, and is a member of the Doylestown Rotary Club. Sean is also the creator of and writer for smokelessmirror.com, where he recently released the article, which inspired this evening's conversation. I'll be putting a link to that article in our chat box so you all can go check it out. I'm now going to turn this over to Sean, who's going to introduce this evening's speakers. Hello, Sean. Thanks for joining us tonight. Hey, Chrissy. Long, long time no see. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's good. Uh, Chrissy and I work together. For those who uh, aren't familiar with it, it's great to be at the bookshop uh, tonight. Uh, it's actually uh, somewhat fitting that uh, I'm here uh, because this is actually where uh, I first heard of um, this, uh, this story that uh, our one uh, local polio survivor, her name's Carol Ferguson, was uh, looking to get some help writing a narrative. And it was our owner, uh, Glenda, who got a call. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, I was on duty and she came and she'd asked uh, if I'd be interested. And uh, Carol and I hit it off. We were actually in the same, uh, same rotary group. I was in the Young Professionals uh, where we met at a different time than Carol, but it all worked out where uh, we finally, we, we linked up and really got uh, to know uh, what she was interested in writing. And it was a fascinating story about these Rotary International Communications team where uh, they would go overseas. And uh, she was interested in how these experiences were, uh, to how they shaped their, uh, their work with Rotary. And uh, they've been doing it for a long time. They do wonderful work. And, but for myself, I really wasn't too familiar with polio. So I had to educate myself and what I found was, uh, as I explored the past, was this menacing virus has been on, around for a long, long time. Uh, did you know horrendous things, you know, for uh, throughout you know the last century, and really uh, tested this nation and the world. And somehow, we found a way uh, all to come together. And it's really a testament to the human spirit. So um, the narrative that became passion, patience, and perseverance. Uh, we. Thank Carol for including me, and uh, we're happy to be here at the Doylestown Bookshop. Uh, so uh, as much as we've been talking about polio, sort of an, how it used to be prevalent here in the States, um, the polio eradication is go, has been going on for a century, but uh, the initiative is uh, has gotten close to zero, but uh, it has not quite reached zero yet. So, uh, uh, and it's important as important as ever uh, now uh, for reasons we'll delve into uh, tonight. Now, this uh, story began in 2019. Um, no, this was a pre-COVID world. Uh, didn't have, really have any of this on uh, on the brain. But fast forward to 2020, and here we are experiencing a new public health crisis, uh, a global, global pandemic that has altered life as we know it. And now due to COVID-19, uh, our family members, uh, some family members have died. Economies have shut down. Uh, movement has been restricted, schools have been closed, and entire industries have perished in just a few months. Uh, and a lot of people are still hurting. Uh, we're here in Doylestown, uh, Pennsylvania, we're no different. We're fortunate that uh, we're open right now. The bookshop, uh, you know, has been has been doing pretty well considering, you know, everything. But, uh, you know, Doylestown is very prideful about uh, shopping local. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, Pennsylvania has been 
somewhat better in the last few months compared to the very beginning when New York and New Jersey were hit and they're our neighbors. So uh, it's been uh, a very interesting 2020. Um, and our thoughts and prayers go out to anyone who has been affected directly or indirectly by COVID. Um, now, as we the weather gets colder, schools attempt to open and uh, cases do begin to rise again. Uh, we're dealing with this new virus that there's a very real fear um, that's palpable uh, with families and people you work with and everything. So the point of tonight is to have a conversation that helps put things into perspective. Uh, we'll look at both viruses and we'll learn from our past to help us deal with the present. Uh, we have two great speakers uh, tonight. Uh, they know a lot about this. Uh, Dan Wilson, who I'll be uh, bringing on here in a moment, and then Mike McGovern, who will be in the second half of our segment. So, uh, can we can we get Dan on screen? Hello, Dan. Hello, John. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for for joining us, uh, Dan. Uh, if for anyone who's not familiar with Dan Wilson, uh, he's been a public health historian. Uh, for quite some time. He's author, authored three books on polio alone. Uh, he has 40 years as a professor at Muhlenberg College. And I'm particularly grateful to Dan because well, he was one of the first editors of Passion, Patience, and Perseverance, where uh, he helped me get the historical elements right in the story that uh, I had been uh, misinformed or uh, misunderstood. So we thank you, Dan, for joining us. I know even after tonight, you'll be your polio duties uh, will will not end here because you uh, are, are well uh, vested in this fight to eradicate polio. Uh, and you, like Carol, who we mentioned before, you too are a polio survivor, correct? Yes, I am. At polio 1955, when I was five years old. So I've been dealing with polio for 65 years. So, no, it's it's amazing when we talk about having a vaccine and and how we how we got it in 1955 and all the people again as we as we work through this, it still is affecting a lot of people here in the U.S. And uh, all your work uh, through the years has been uh, been very helpful for to keep uh, you know this as a uh, time capsule so we can understand. Uh, you know, what it was like and what it is like for people who are, who are still experiencing, still getting polio. Um, now, this coronavirus is a new virus, a novel virus. Um, we're all learning about it, how it spreads, how best uh, to respond. Um, now, history has shown us that health crises like this are not unprecedented. Uh, so can you take us back to a time when polio outbreaks were new? Can you paint us a picture of what that fear, um, the fear that was felt and the struggle that ensued um, and how we all really uh, responded you know, to these very real tragedies that people, uh, that families have experienced. Well, let me do a little bit of a history of polio and then we'll talk some about the similarities and differences with COVID. Um, <clears throat> polio was probably the most feared childhood disease of the 20th century, um, in part because it crippled children uh, uh, and it could in fact, if it affected your breathing muscles, uh, kill somebody. But the crippling was more of a fear for parents than actually death, because it was far more common. Um, polio first appeared epidemic form in the United States in Vermont in the 1890s. Uh, the first uh, biggest uh, polio epidemic was in New York and the Northeast in 1916. And that's a photograph from uh, the New York epidemic in 1916. Um, the, there were a total of about 27,000 cases and some 8,000 deaths. At, at that point, there were no ventilators. The iron lung had not been invented. So if polio affected your breathing, uh, the chances were that you were not going to survive. Um, five years later, of course, Franklin Roosevelt contracted polio at the old age of 39. That would have a major impact on the history of polio in the 20th century. Um, in 1927, Roosevelt established the Warm Springs as the first dedicated polio rehabilitation facility, in part to help himself recover from polio, but also to help other polio survivors. As I said, the first dedicated polio rehab facility. <clears throat> 11 years later, Roosevelt, with his 
Law partner Basil O'Connor established the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which I've always thought was misnamed. Nobody was for infantile paralysis, which was the original name for polio. Everybody was against it, but nonetheless, that was the name. But more familiarly known as the March of Dimes, because in the midst of the Depression, they encouraged people to send their dimes to Roosevelt. That's what people could afford. And it was named the March of Dimes. Um, March of Dimes has played a very important role because it basically funded all of the research uh, into the polio uh, virus, uh, funded the uh, development of the vaccines, funded the research trial in 1954, uh, the federal government played almost no role in the development of uh, polio research and the vaccines. It was all funded by the March of Dimes, who not only funded research, uh, but funded, uh, paid for braces, hospitalization, wheelchairs, iron lungs, and so forth. So it was a dual benefit for polio survivors. Um, once the March of Dimes started spending money on research. Polio research uh, increased significantly in the late 30s and 40s. Um, they began supporting Jonas Salk uh, after World War II at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Salk very early began to work on a killed virus vaccine. He had experience with flu vaccines uh, during the war. And so the goal was to kill the virus and develop a vaccine. Um, by the early 1950s, he had developed a vaccine. He began to test it in institutions uh, with children in Western Pennsylvania, then with school children, um, increasing the number of, of uh, subjects in each time. Finally, by 1954, he was ready for um, a major test of his vaccine. Again, it would be funded by uh, the March of Dimes, and this was the 1954 Salk field trial, which was run not by Salk, but by Dr. Thomas Francis at the University of Michigan in order to ensure that there was no bias, that Salk couldn't uh, cook the books in favor of his vaccine. Um, they enrolled about 1.3 million children uh some would receive the the vaccine some would receive a placebo and some would be observed controls now it's hard for me to imagine today that parents 1.3 million parents would enroll their children in an experimental vaccine trial but the fear of polio was so great that parents were anxious to enroll their children in the field trial because it meant theoretically at least, that their child would be protected a year before anybody else. They needed, needed the large numbers uh, for the trial because polio was actually a relatively rare disease. You had to have enough people who could potentially get polio and could potentially be protected by the vaccine. It began in the spring of 1954 Polio was typically in the summer, summer and fall, so you had to have the vaccine given before polio season. And then they waited. They kept track of every child who was a participant to see whether or not uh, they came down with any problems because of the vaccine or whether they were protected or developed polio. Um, in April of 1955, April 12th, 1955, which was 10 years to the day after Roosevelt died, the March of Dimes arranged a presentation at the University of Michigan where Dr. Francis would announce the results of the trial. And he had good news for America. He announced that all three versions of the vaccine, because there are three types of polio, that all three versions were both safe and effective. Uh, the vaccine, in fact, worked as Salk had anticipated. Uh, that was the Time Magazine uh, cover uh, following the announcement. 
Um, the U.S. government now finally had a role to play. It licensed the vaccine that afternoon. Uh, Basil O'Connor was confident enough about the vaccine that he had arranged some 9 million uh, doses to be prepared even before it was approved so that they could begin distributing it immediately. And so it went out um, to the nation. Unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, there was the infamous Cutter incident, uh, a batch of vaccine produced by Cutter Laboratories in Berkeley had not been killed. Uh, some 200,000 doses had been sent out. Um, and some 200,000 people were infected, uh, 164 paralyzed and 10 died. That shut down uh, the vaccine uh, process for some weeks until the federal government declared the other uh, lots of vaccine by other manufacturers were safe and vaccination removed. Now, as I said, I had polio in 1955. I was living in northern Wisconsin in September. There was a shortage of the vaccine, probably because of the, in part because of the Cutter incident. And they decided to give the vaccine only to kids going to school. And I was one year short of going to school. So I didn't get the vaccine and I got uh, the virus instead. Now the SOC vaccine is very effective, but it's a shot. It requires uh, more than one shot to be effective. Meanwhile, Albert Sabin at the University of Cincinnati was working on a attenuated live uh, vaccine uh, where the, vac the virus is weakened. So it can't give you a case of polio, but will create the antibodies necessary to protect you. Um, he had to try his uh, vaccine in the Soviet Union because so many people in the United States had been protected by the soft vaccine. It proved to be equally effective. It was easier to give the famous sugar cube or drop of the vaccine on a sugar cube, which kids much preferred to a shot. And the advantage of the Sabin is A, it's easier to give, it's cheaper. Um, and it also mimics a case of polio. So to some extent, it provides a stronger level of protection. But the combination of the Salk vaccine and the Sabin vaccine, uh, which came online in the early 1960s, quickly uh, reduced the cases of polio in the United States. So that by the late 70s, polio in the United States was substantially eradicated. Um, it was not eradicated worldwide. Um, in eight, by 1988, there were an estimated uh, 350,000 cases of polio a year worldwide. Rotary began to get involved in 1985 with their Polio Plus campaign to uh, ensure that every child worldwide could be protected against polio. The World Health Organization got involved in 1988 with a world campaign. Other groups have joined Rotary and the World Health, the Gates Foundation, for example, um, to eradicate polio. It's theoretically possible to eradicate polio because <clears throat> there's no non-human host. So if you can get the la everybody protected, the virus, in fact, will become extinct. We're down to two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And in recent years, probably less than 100 people uh, worldwide have come down with world, uh, wild polio. So they were on the verge, but it's proving very difficult to get those last cases of uh, polio so that they can truly be eradicated. Um, and that uh, raises interesting uh, comparisons with COVID-19. Uh, and I'd like to talk just a little bit about some uh, uh, similarities and differences. They're both viruses, obviously, uh, which means antibiotics are not effective. You need a vaccine against to protect against the virus. They're both highly infectious. 
easy to catch if you're in the wrong circumstances. Uh, they both have large numbers of asymptomatic or inapparent cases. It's been estimated that 90 to 95% of polio infections were inapparent. Uh, the virus stayed in the intestines, did not migrate to the uh, spinal cord and thus produced no paralysis. I must have caught my polio from somebody inapparent because I was the only person in the neighborhood who come down, came down with uh, paralytic polio. COVID has been estimated that anywhere between 25 and 40 percent of infections are inapparent. Both are relatively new. Polio is actually an old disease, but it only became epidemic in the 20th century because of changes in sanitation. Uh, COVID, of course, seems to have jumped from a bat sometime maybe 2019, 2018. Uh, we're not quite sure. Um, both have lingering consequences. Uh, those of us with post polio syndrome, I've been living with polio for 65 years, as I'm sure many on the on the uh, session tonight. Uh, and we're learning that many people who recover from corona, uh, corona COVID-19 um, also seem to have lingering consequences. There's some significant differences between the two. Polio is an intestinal disease primarily. It's spread through food and water contaminated via fecal material. Um, COVID, of course, is a respiratory disease. Uh, spread through the air, uh, spread when people breathe out, say and talk, uh, sneeze, cough, whatever. COVID is much easier to catch. Uh, you can catch polio standing in a room with somebody or catch COVID standing in a room with somebody um, walking down the street, uh, sitting in a crowded auditorium and so forth. Uh, that's not the case with polio. Polio, you have to ingest contaminated water or food, which is much more difficult uh, situation. So uh, in terms of public um, risk, uh, polio is a much lower risk. Um, COVID, of course, is new. It seems to have jumped from a bat in the last year or two, which means that we don't have any immunity to the disease, whereas polio has been traced as far back as three to 4,000 years to the ancient Egyptians. Another difference is that uh, most of the polio research, as I said, was funded, privately funded by private philanthropy, the March of Dimes, whereas most of the COVID resources, research has been funded by the federal government. Um, it was a vaccine, of course, or actually two vaccines, that brought an end to uh, the polio epidemics in most of the world. And if we're to bring an end to COVID, uh, we will do it largely through a vaccine, I'm quite convinced. But there are problems, of course. Uh, uh, both Eli Lilly today and, and uh, blacking on the other uh, Johnson & Johnson announced problems with their trial vaccines and they were both suspending their trials of the vaccine so they figured out what was what was the problem so it may be a while before we have a successful vaccine hopefully faster than Salk and Sabin but there is no guaranteed route to a vaccine as the Cutter incident proved with the case of polio um, we have a lot more powerful medical resources uh, than we did than Salk and Sabin we're working with. Uh, so I'm fairly confident that we will eventually have a vaccine, but it's going to take longer than any of us like. Very different diseases, significant impact. Uh, polio probably had less economic impact than COVID uh, because it was much more of a regional disease. If Philadelphia had an epidemic, 
that didn't mean that Pittsburgh or Allentown, where I am, had an epidemic um, because it affected mainly children. It tended to shut down things like schools, swimming pools, uh, playgrounds, and so forth, but uh, not adult kinds of situations like bars and restaurants and so forth. So the economic impact of polio was both regional and less significant than COVID. Um, but whereas polio was a characteristic disease of the 20th century, uh, COVID may be the disease of the 21st century. So that's a very quick history and overview of uh, polio and a little bit of a comparison with the COVID epidemic. No, we, Sean, we thank you have you. questions? We thank you. I, I'm just to, from listening, I can already see just the family dynamic with, with all of it and how it's just today as it, you know, with even though it's older population, uh, again, it's still family and you now children who had got right. polio uh, is, you know, that, that family connection will never, you know, be diminished. And I think all uh, for everyone here who's tuned in is, is obviously, I think, aware of that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all concerned and uh, we thank you. And I know uh, Chrissy has been scanning the, the questions and uh, some of the people who have joined us, uh, we want to give them some time uh, for Chrissy to ask so they can uh, get uh, some answers uh, uh, from, from yourself, Dan, while you're still here. Sure. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Dan. Uh, the first question is, how Stand long you, did Christy. it? Oh, can you hear me now? How about can now? You. Can you hear me? Okay, I can't, but <laughs> you, Dan can hear me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, can you hear me, Dan? I can work on that. I can hear you, Sean. I can't hear Chrissy. Okay, Sean. Uh, so maybe yes. you can relay the question. Would questions. you like to look at the questions? Uh, I was going to ask. Technology uh, is great when it works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how long it actually right. took to develop the vaccine? Was it years or months? Okay, so uh, Dan, the, the question was, how long did it take for the vaccine to, to be developed? Uh, was it months or was it years? <laughs> well, there was an abortive attempt in the 1935, two doctors who came up with a vaccine which actually gave people polio. So the, the March of Dimes started in 1938, began seriously funding polio research but there was a lot of basic research in polio that had to be done before you could even talk about a vaccine. They didn't know how many types of polio there were, how to grow the virus and so forth. So Salk really began his work and Sabin after World War II. So let's say 1945, 46 is when they began in earnest working on a vaccine. Um, so Salk, let's say worked eight to 10 years before his vaccine was approved. Uh, it's easier to kill a virus than it is to attenuate it or weaken it. So Sabin had to work another six or seven years. So Sabin worked probably close to almost 20 years uh, before he developed his vaccine. His vaccine was approved. Salk probably eight or nine so it, it was, it was, a, you've got to under, before you can develop a vaccine, you've got to understand the virus. And that's part of what they're working on today with COVID. And so you had to know, for example, with polio, there were three types, fortunately. So you know, had to have three kinds of vaccine, but you had to be able to grow the virus. If you're going to make a vaccine, you've got to have massive quantities of the virus to kill or weaken. So uh the only nobel prize for polio research was awarded to john enders and his colleagues at harvard who figured out how to safely grow the virus so that you could make enough a virus to make a vaccine so there were a lot of steps before you could come up with a successful vaccine and they came up with two very successful vaccines dan can you hear my hear me now another question can you hear me? I guess not. Okay. Guess that is okay. I, I can still Sean. hear you, Chrissy, so I could definitely relay it. Sure. Okay. Are polio survivors more susceptible to the COVID virus? 
Well, you're, uh, so while Dan, you're waiting, go ahead, Sean. So, uh, Dan, the uh, question was, are polio survivors more susceptible to the coronavirus? Well, from what I know, and I, some of this comes from my being on the board of Post Polio Health International, which has uh, looked into this question. And our experts, the doctors that we have on our board and that we have access to have said that there's nothing particular about uh, polio survivors that makes them more susceptible to COVID. Now, most of us, of course, are over the age of 65, which puts us in a vulnerable group uh, because we can't exercise. I suspect some of us are in the obese category or have heart problems or the rest of it. So we have, we're susceptible to the other risk factors of COVID like age and so forth. But polio itself does not seem to have increased, at least as far as those experts that we have at Post Polio Health International uh, know that polio, being a polio survivor by itself doesn't increase the risk of COVID-19. And I, I would just put that in as a plug for Post Polio Health International. Um, if you're looking for good information on post polio, um, you know, postpolio.org or Polio Place are our two websites, and I would urge you to go there and check things out. Questions like that are good ones that we may have the information for you that's available on the website. Well, Sean, would you thank Daniel for me? <laughs> yes, and Daniel, okay. uh, Chrissy, and, and I are, are, we thank you for, for joining in. I know. Uh, you know, this is uh, is a busy time of year with Bull, World Polio Day coming up and everything. So um, we thank you for for sharing all the knowledge and and for all the work you've done all over the years uh, as a polio survivor. And uh, uh, and just uh, you know, we 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 can't be more as appreciative. Uh, yeah, there, there's no there's no words that we can uh, do to share how how we really feel. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you, Dan. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chrissy. And now we're going to bring on, Sean's going to bring on Mike McGovern for us. Hello, Mike. Good evening, Sean. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we've, we just heard from, from Dan and, and it's a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, and I know uh, you're, you're joining us from, from Maine, and uh, we thank you because uh, you, uh, you, know, you have uh, a lot on your plate as well uh, with coming with World, World Polio Day coming up. And uh, just to give people a little uh, background, uh, Mike, uh, Mike is the uh, chair of Rotary International's Polio Plus Committee. Uh, he's been the chair since 2014. Uh, and if Anyone who does a web search on Polio Plus, uh, Mike's name comes up everywhere. Um, he's on vi he's on videos. He's on uh, in scholarly journals. Uh, his fingerprints are all over this eradication initiative. Uh, so, uh, with World Polio Day coming up October 24th, uh, we appreciate you taking the time now, so close to that date. Uh, so, we really thank you for being here. Thank you, Sean. That's great. Um, now, uh, for those of us unfamiliar with uh, Polio Plus. Could you uh, please tell us a little bit about how this organization, organization came about and uh, what their mission is? Yeah, Sean, uh, it's very good to be with you tonight. And I too enjoyed Dan's comments. I thought uh, very educational and, you know, I've read some of the history, but I didn't know it all. So it, it was very good to hear. Uh, Polio Plus came about, uh, originally there were some Rotarians in the Philippines in the late 1970s who didn't quite feel it was right that people in places like Canada and the United States, uh, the children were not getting polio, but yet they were still getting polio in the Philippines. So the, Phil the Rotarians in the Philippines approached Rotary International and said, could you help us with this project? Could you give us a grant to eliminate polio in the Philippines? And the Rotary Foundation with support from Rotarians provided a grant. Uh, they worked with actually the Marcos government Imelda Marcos, who some people may remember in history, uh, she was involved. And uh, three years later, 
there was no more wild polio virus in the Philippines. Well, Rotarians were looking for a project for Rotary Centennial, uh, something that could be accomplished over a long term by 2005. And there were a couple of different recommendations on that. And they decided uh, actually from a Rotarian who recommended a project who, who was actually was employed by the National Institutes of Health, where Dr. Fauci works, and he recommended why not the eradication of polio? Smallpox had been eliminated. So Rotary uh, first approached the World Health Organization, and basically they told Rotary, no, 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 you, you, you don't know anything about medical science. Uh, you're, you're just a group of volunteers. And at the time, you know, there weren't the public-private uh, initiatives and partnerships that there were now. Anyway, so Rotary, you know, they, there was a little bit, well, you know, maybe. So Rotary decided to go out and try to raise some money. They tried to raise $120 million dollars and they raised 240 million. So the Rotarians went back to the World Health Organization. And now that when Rotarians offered them 240 million dollars to help with the cause, they were a lot more willing to listen to Rotary. Uh, so Rotary, the World Health Organization, World Health Assembly, agreed to work with us on it. Along came UNICEF, the U US Centers for Disease Control, uh, eventually the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and more recently, uh, Gavi, the uh, the vaccine alliance, and that that's the partnership. That's the Polio Plus. We call it Polio Plus because we're eradicating polio, but we're also helping in so many ways uh, with with other preventable diseases, particularly vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, and you know, we're we're working and have worked in countries around the world. And you know, as as uh, Dan mentioned, we're now down to two countries: uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, with cases of wild polio. Yeah, it's just amazing. I, I think it was just last month or, or two months ago that Africa was now first declared polio free uh, for the first time ever. And going from 1988, 125 countries, 350,000 cases to uh, Africa now being the, the continent has just been cleared. And now it only being in two neighboring countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan it is an amazing amount of progress. And um, I know there's a lot more um a lot of challenges still to come um but for now since 2018 there were just 33 cases and there's been a little bit of uptick uh of wild polio 19 uh, 176 was last year and i think there's been about 100 this year um can you speak to the challenges specific to that region again afghanistan and pakistan i had actually been in the military and i'd been in afghanistan it's very tribal it's a uh, there's a uh, you know no real public health as we know it here in the states, uh, but can, can you tell us a little bit about um, that region and what how the uh, eradication the uh, GPEI uh, as they call it, Global Polio Eradication Initiative how they've responded in this region? Uh, good question, Sean. You know I think you really hit it at the very beginning with your comment saying that. That, that it's tribal and particularly in Afghanistan and, and no health system. The, the challenge in you know, this entire region has been uh, you know, th those two factors, as well as a very mobile population, as well as large numbers of children. Uh, there's also been some uh, uh, disagreements with the program, uh, feeling that it's, it's Western dominated and you know, some of the politics of, of the region has made it difficult. Uh, you know, in recent years, uh, you know, we, we actually got the cases down to 22 worldwide in, in 2017. Uh, but then a, a couple of things happened. Uh, one is uh, we, we had a setback in the polio program. I only mean in the polio program, uh, in the, the action that, that took out Osama bin Laden. And uh, prior to that happening, there was a a doctor who went to the property who was uh, distributing vaccines. And he actually wasn't a doc, he was a doctor, but he, he apparently was working for the CIA. And the, the rumor got out that he was there on polio. He wasn't there on polio, but it, it created distrust. It created uh, uh, some issues there. The other thing that happened, you know, more recently than that is there was a change in government in, uh, in Pakistan. And the, the new leader uh, is a gentleman by the name of Imran Khan, great supporter of polio eradication. In fact, before he was the prime minister, actually had the, the, uh, the, the privilege or the honor of visiting him in his home. 
Uh, and you know, we, we, we before he was prime minister, we worked with all the political parties. They were all very supportive. And the politics, you know, if you look at the history of Benazir Bhutto and other, can be quite divisive to, to make it an understatement in Pakistan. But on polio, we had working everything together. Well, Imran Khan came in, again, a great supporter of polio eradication. But he, he, he brought in all new staff, including one person who tried to politicize the program, who tried to make it advantage to one party over another. That's not the way to get anything done. You know, you need all the political parties, all of the voices, working together to, to create uh, vaccine confidence. The other issue that happened was uh, we were having something called the National Immunization Day in Peshawar, which is up in uh, the, the, the Khyber area near the Afghani border. And there were some people who weren't fond of the polio program. And they uh, actually made a fake video that they put on WhatsApp and, and on Facebook. And they showed kids getting polio drops and then dropping onto the floor. Well, you know, the vials weren't the vials that the polio program uses. Uh, and they made the mistake of the video, uh, you know, no, not erasing the rehearsals for what they were doing. Uh, but anyway, th th those went absolutely viral online. And 200,000 children went to the hospitals and doctors claiming that they had problems and issues because they took the polio vaccine. You know, not a single kid was sick. But the damage was done. It reduced confidence, and it's taking time to rebuild us. The final factor uh, is we have anti-government elements in Afghanistan, uh, namely the Taliban, also ISIS elements. And for the last two years, they have banned house-to-house -house campaigns. Again, concerned with you know people maybe snooping around that they don't want snooping around. So you know what we do to deal with all all of that is we really be sure that you know all of the polio workers, frontline workers are all people in their communities. They're community-based vaccinators, uh, mostly women. And, uh, you know, they're, they're amazing people in, 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 in what they're able to accomplish. So yeah, there's, there's been some challenges. We're working to overcome them. And, you know, my, my view is if we can do this in, you know, 190 odd countries, whatever the balance is, uh, we can do it in two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, whatever happens, you keep working through it. And we've seen pictures uh, popping up or showing people wearing masks and washing hands. And, um, you know, there's uh, there's so much uh, support for uh, polio eradication. And there's a uh, picture of you'll see in a moment where there's a racers and they're running the race to zero um, right here. And uh, this is uh, from a local uh, a local 5K race from uh, last year, I believe. And it's just uh, the support so many years later from where polio has been basically removed from the United States from since 1979 to, uh, again, these people are, are still living with it all these years later. And I uh, know there's just cultural challenges, political challenges, um, you know, you need trust. And I think that's that's a lot of what we're seeing sort of the, um, you know, some of that here where having an, a, you know, somewhat rapid uh, vaccine that it, it will take time to really, um, you know, understand, you know, people's concerns with that and work through that here and everywhere. Uh, and we want to um, talk a little bit now with, uh, you know, we saw people with masks on and um, overseas already and sort of working with this. And But polio eradication still needs to happen. Uh, and the uh, it, the vac vaccinations and everything still need to happen. Uh, so what uh, have the GPE, what precautions have they been taking, um, you know, so they can immunize children for polio while mitigating the spread of COVID? Uh, great question, Sean. You know, in uh, in mid March, when polio, when excuse me, when COVID nineteen really was pretty indicative of where it might be going, uh, we suspended uh, the polio program temporarily in terms of the door to door, house to house vaccinations. Uh, however, we 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 did keep up surveillance and we kept up other activities, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, to support the COVID response. Uh, but but you know as a result of that pause, we were we were able to do education and training of the polio workers. We were able to find the personal protective equipment, the masks, the shields, uh, protective clothing, uh, and and uh, you know acquire the sanitizer, acquire all those things. And so you know about a month and a half ago, we we we, we began to resume the program uh, first in Burkina Faso, and then uh, more of late. Uh, in uh, in Pakistan 
and in Afghanistan. So the program is fully up and running. It's being done very safely. It's doing by being done by those community-based vaccinators. And they're also providing, you know, assistance and uh, other information on COVID. You know, they're providing when they go door to doors, in some places they're providing masks, they're providing sanitizer, uh, they're providing other elements, one to encourage people to get the polio drops, uh, but also to help people as uh, to reduce the risk of COVID. Now, um, we talk about the plus in Polio Plus, and, and uh, I talk a little bit about this in the, uh, in the article itself, about in order to deliver the polio vaccine to the most remote places in the world, um, is, uh, it took a uh, global infrastructure had to be built, uh, which had never existed before. And can you talk a little bit about um, how the, this polio infrastructure um, has been used to help with other diseases and could one day help with uh, the, uh, to leverage the, uh, hopefully in the near future, COVID vaccine? You know, yeah, the polio infrastructures uh, helped with, uh, you know, the continue with measles, with rubella, uh, you know, with, with so many uh, diseases, particularly in Africa. It's it's the the polio network does that does that. In fact, Dr. Shidi Moedi, who was the regional director of the World Health Organization in uh, Africa, said a few weeks ago, in Africa, no one has the footprint of the polio program nor the expertise for mounting effective response campaigns. With COVID-19 threatening to overwhelm health systems, the extensive polio response network is once again lending crucial support as countries build up systems to uh, contain COVID-19. So what we're doing, uh, amongst other things, is you know, we have a surveillance system that identifies people with polio. That surveillance system has been repurposed to also identify COVID cases. They're doing the uh, testing uh, at, at, at these centers that are funded in part by the polio program. Uh, we, we also, uh, we have laboratories and it's the polio laboratories where a lot of the tests are going who are providing the service. In From April to December of this year, and some of it is prospective, nearly 4,000 polio staff from the World Health Organization have responded uh, to help out with, uh, with with COVID, and you know, and and you know, and we have a lot of experience with vaccine introduction, with the cold chain of vaccine logistics, the ability, as you indicated, to reach uh, remote communities. Some of the things Rotary has funded us, and we get grant requests, is everything from boats to motorcycles to camels, and they they rent these things to to help get to some of these remote areas. So, you know, we just have you know tremendous support uh, infrastructure out there uh, that, we, that we know how to mobilize immunization campaigns. We know how to do the social mobilization. Uh, you know, we've, we've been able to convince people, you know, in all these different countries. But, you know, in the end, to be successful with COVID, to be successful with polio, it needs to be the program of the people in the communities. It can't be Rotary International's program. It can't be the World Health Organization. They need to adopt it as their program. That's what will get us uh, to the finish line. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, for COVID, you know, for some people, they may not be afraid of contracting COVID, especially younger people. Um, but no one wants to say they want to spread COVID to someone who is, you know, more susceptible to the virus. I think that. Um, there's going to be a conversation about that. It's not that they're so much, um, you know, will be affected, you know, if they're young and, and if there are maybe no underlying health conditions. Um, and uh, this it's, it's, it's is a major challenge that every country in different communities are going to have to face in because you know, they all have different uh, political systems, different, uh, you know, different challenges as you see in uh, the polio vaccines where you've got uh, you know, the soft vaccine is more effective in some areas that have maybe uh, more infrastructure where the Sabin vaccine, which are the drops, um, are, you know, some are more important there uh, and more effective in other areas. So I think even when vaccines come out, um, the GPEI, you know, I think that will, they'll have to look at all those things. And if there, is there a clear winner? Is there somewhere that's one's more effective than another? There's so much that still needs to happen. Um, and we're so grateful that uh, polio uh, survivors and Rotarians and everyone has gone, uh, and anyone who's ever donated to it have gone all this time with really understanding that it's it needs polio needs to be gone. And look at this great infrastructure that has been left behind it. It's just amazing. 
um, that have come up. Um, now for vaccines, and we're talking about them for moving forward for here, and we'll, hopefully we'll have one sooner rather than later. Uh, it took decades to develop the polio vaccines. Um, science has made you know such strides since then, and now we're actually have expectations there will be a vaccine soon. Um, vaccines are a very personal decision, uh, you know, for families, their children. Um, from your perspective, uh, what scientific factors do you recommend people consider when gauging any new vaccine? Sean, I'm not a, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a rotary volunteer. Uh, you know, what, what you, you indicated, you see my name a lot on the internet. Uh, you know, I, I never profess to be a scientist. And, you know, my, my advice to anyone is, is listen to the scientists, read carefully. I, you know, I was on a similar panel out of uh, the Boston area about a week ago, and it, it was fascinating listening to the doctors and, you know, one of them indicated, for example, something I hadn't thought of uh, is one thing that you need to be very careful of is, you know, if you have some sort of autoimmune disease, uh, you know, that, that, you know, causes some issues, you know, if it's a live virus that they end up, excuse me, live vaccine they end up coming out with, uh, you've got to be real careful about taking that uh, because, it, you know, your immune system might not be attuned to it. And, you know, th there's all these different issues. So, you know, my advice to everyone is, is uh, read carefully, uh, and uh, you know the, the you know there's going to be scientists on every side of the issue, uh, but you know I uh, I still have faith in the CDC. I have faith in the World Health Organization. Uh, I know a lot of the folks that work there. I've worked uh, both with, and I do work with Dr. Tedros, the head of WHO, and Dr. Redfield, the, the head of the CDC, and so many people there. So. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're good people. And, uh, you know, particularly in this day and age, I know it's become a little bit political, but, you know, I'm hoping things calm down after the election and uh, we'll see where we go from there. Uh, that's, that's, we're, that's such a um, such good wisdom right now. I think it's, everyone's very charged and we all know there's a uh, political process taking place. And, um, you know, we're well, it's time to use our cooler heads uh, now and after the election and really, again, take that time to really educate oneself on what, you know, what, what the vaccines are and what they're, what they're saying that they'll do. Um, and uh, now we have a few minutes left. We'd love to have Chrissy come up and, and see if uh, we can get some questions answered, uh, uh, questions asked uh, from her. Uh, Chrissy, are, are you there? Okay, so let me see. Uh, let's see what we can do. I'm going to look to see if I can read any of the comments or questions. I, I can see Susan's comment. Uh, Wyatt, you want me to do okay. that one? Yeah, please do. Yeah, anything you, you can go through would be probably best. Yeah, Susan Wyatt is asking, what about the reports of vaccine-derived polio for mutations, and how is that being handled? Uh, Susan, uh, we, we also, in addition to the wild polio virus cases, uh, do have something called vaccine-derived polio. And th these are, as you indicate, they're from mutations. And this is when uh, people who get the polio vaccine shed the vaccine, and then it's picked up by people who are under-immunized. Their, their, their immunology system's not working right. We actually have had over 300 of those cases uh, this year. Uh, the, the good news is, as you know, uh, John Nanny indicates, himself a polio survivor, good Rotarian, is we do have a new oral polio vaccine uh, that's been developed. And this has taken 10 years, by the way. This no, They call it the novel oral polio vaccine, 10 years to be developed. It's a lot less stable. Uh, we've gone through the clinical trials. Every indication so far is that uh, it will work. It will do away with the vaccine-derived cases. And uh, we're actually waiting an early use license. Uh, as I said, all the, the, you know, the trials, the, all the initial trials have been conducted. And uh, you know, we hope for that any week now, and then that will begin to roll out. And we, we're really hopeful that that will reduce the, uh, the so-called vaccine-derived polio cases. Okay. I see Christy again. 
I'm we're having some connectivity issues this evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have a few questions here from our viewers. Um, when the COVID vac uh, vaccine comes along, would it be valuable to have antibody testing first in case there are after effects uh, uh, of those who contracted COVID as with post polio? I, I'm not I'm not a doctor and I I'd you know I'd be guessing like anyone else so I'd, I'd 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 defer to uh I'd prefer not to answer the question sorry That is okay. Um, I I don't want to you know I think it's important in this field you got a lot of people giving a lot of opinions and when you really don't know you ought to just say you don't know. <laughs> that sounds good to me. All right, here's another question that might work out. Uh, what resources are needed to eradicate polio in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Is it money, people, education, or all of the above? It's, it's all of the above. Uh, you know, ro Rotary, to, to just as an example, to, for the, to get rid of the wild polio virus in Africa, over the years, we spent just under $1 billion of, rot of funds donated by Rotary just to get uh, Africa polio free. It's very expensive as well in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, you know, you know, oftentimes, you know, we, we just forget how many children are there and the number of people we need to immunize. We're still needing to immunize 450 million children a year, as long as there's any po polio in the world. So, you know, ro Rotarians each year have a goal of $50 million and all of the money that is used to support polio plus is then matched by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation two to one. So every dollar that's given to Polio Plus becomes three dollars. And so there, you know, with, with that support from the Gates Foundation, R Rotary, Rotarians, with the match, put $150 million into polio eradication. And we actually spend more than that now in Pakistan and Afghanistan alone. Uh, but you know, we're, we're confident, you know, if you, but, but you know, if you look at the cost of the vaccines, you look at the cost of the delivery systems, uh, you know, it, it adds up. It's, it's actually, if you look at the whole picture, to deliver a, uh, a polio vaccine to a child, the, the, the full all cost in uh, is, is about $2 per vaccine. Wow. Okay. And another question here. Compared to polio of the 50s, which disease other than COVID could be considered the modern day equivalent? Uh, you know, pick it. It could, could be Ebola, it could be AIDS. Uh, you know, there are, you know, so many disease, you know, obviously, you know, there, there are some people, you know, that would like to have a worldwide effort to eradicate measles. And, you know, we've made some progress on that. And, you know, I recently read, uh, you know, that in, in the Americas, there was a declaration of being declared free of measles and rubella. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's other people working on malaria issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, if there's disease out there, you know, there's, fortunately there's people that want to do it. And, you know, you look at, you know, even the, the different cancers and, uh, you know, the research that goes on there and how important that is. Okay. And there's two well, we questions. We thank you. Uh... Sorry, yeah, saying I, I didn't know for how much time, but now we just want to thank uh, Mike. Um, I know we're coming up on time, but uh, you've been uh, so helpful in understanding. Again, sometimes saying, "Hey, that's not my that's not what my expertise," and 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 that's and that's okay. We all have you know different things we're knowledgeable on, and and you know it's uh, that's so important. Uh, you know, to, today everyone has an opinion and they want to say it, um, and uh, I think it's. Uh, you, you brought so much to this conversation, uh, and Dan as well, um, that uh, we feel, uh, you know, so so blessed to have had uh, you take your time out here today. And I know um, you'll be even speaking to this uh, Rotary District on uh, World Polio Day, October 24th. So um, everyone uh, who's interested in that, uh, you know, they'll they'll get some more on the infrastructure. I think they'll probably have some more questions on that as well. Um, but we definitely would thank you for, for taking the time today. Yes, thank, thank you, you Sean. Both. Thanks, Christy. You're welcome. Thank you both so much. Uh, thank you also, Mr. Daniel Wilson, for joining us. And if you would like to read the article that Sean wrote uh, that inspired this conversation, I just 
uh, put the link in the chat box. I'd encourage you all to go to his website, smokelessmirror.com, and take a look at that. Uh, thank you all for joining us again, gentlemen. Thank you so much. And Chrissy, one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, just oh, yes. uh, while, while we do have everyone here, I know uh, uh, fundraising and every all sort of coming together, uh, um, you know, how we usually come together uh, to fundraise uh, has been altered this year. Um, and this region, uh, we're doing a, a virtual 5K for, uh, for Polio Plus. So, and like uh, uh, Mike had mentioned, with um, the Gates Foundation, every donation is matched two to one. Uh, so uh, they can do give $10 and that would be turned to $30. $150, you know, or $50 would turn to $150 and so on and so on. Um, anyone who's liked what they've heard about uh, Polio Plus here, um, they can join. Uh, they can hit the link uh, below uh, and support Polio Plus. There are different teams that people could uh, could uh, give money to. They could join that those teams. Um, they could um, uh, they could start their own team, uh, or they could just give a general donation. But uh, in these interesting times that we're living, uh, you know, these are one of the ways. To, so virtual 5K. Um, people can come out. They can check out check that out uh, at the link provided at the uh, call to action button there. Thank you, Sean. And also, this program was recorded and will be available uh, to rewatch here and on the Doylestown Bookshop's YouTube channel if you'd like to, if you missed part of it, if you'd like to watch the full program. Thank you all so much for viewing. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye, everybody.